one cross it? On what were its footing set? Or who laid its cornerstone? While the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy. John 38, 4.
So with that said, uh, again, we welcome you into the Lord's house, and we do want to notice announcements. Uh, this morning, the book club will be meeting. They have a catered lunch. Uh, I understand Kate Chandler has prepared a, a, uh, a nice lunch for those who are part of the book club and, and wish to uh, gather following the worship this morning. Uh, that will be, again, immediately following worship. Unfortunately, we do need to have a quick board meeting, so we ask board members to please come to the front immediately following the service. We want to do that quickly so that we can get those who are part of the, the book club but also part of the board. Uh, we want to try to get through the little bit of business that we need to take care of so that they can get on to the book club. So board members will just meet right here very quickly following worship uh, this morning. Shouldn't take but a few minutes. Looking through the week, don't forget the Bible studies. We have the, the Wednesday morning study out in Broadway at Town and Country. Uh, that's at 9.30 on Wednesday. There's the evening study that's here at the church on uh, Wednesday evening at 7. And then for those who prefer the, the Facebook Live uh, Bible study, that is on Thursday evening at 7. And again, all of those studies are different, so if you want to participate in more than one, you're not going to be seeing the same thing in each. They are different studies. Uh, as we look forward to next week uh, in the evening, uh, we will be having the Promised Land Quartet here. Uh, that will be at 6 p.m. Uh, we would love to fill the house for that program. So if you're able to come, mark your calendar and plan to be here for a great time of, of music and fellowship uh, again next Sunday evening. Uh, if you look over in the social hall, things are continuing to progress, uh, not always as quickly as I'd like to see them, and I'm sure is not as quickly as you'd like, but we are moving ahead. Uh, if you're interested in seeing the colors, uh, we had the primer coat on the walls uh, a couple of weeks ago. This week we have the first coat of paint. You'll see that the paint comes down so far in the social hall, and then below that it's a different color and it's not a very clean, straight line. We'll have a chair rail all the way around uh, the social hall, and what you'll see is the lighter color above, the darker color below. That's, that's what it will be in, when it's finished. And then if you look on the back wall, there's a piece of the, uh, the trim there, a piece of the baseboard that's painted with the trim color. So you can see the three colors uh, that will be there and, and kind of get a, a better picture of what it's gonna look like over there. You can see how much larger the space seems to be as we've opened up those classrooms and I uh, hope that everyone is, is pleased with, uh, with what you're seeing and uh, we're looking forward to uh, being able to get that finished and then we can dedicate that building uh, to the Lord and to his service. I think it's giving us a much nicer facility and better facility that we can use uh, to glorify our God. That's ultimately what it's all about. Uh, things are moving ahead, and uh, we're hoping that big things are going to happen this week, but we've got to, as they say, make the stars align uh, to get everything done. It's a lot that we're planning for this week. We'll see if it all works out, but uh, we'll uh, keep moving ahead. So again, uh, do take notice of that. I do want to mention, uh, we've heard a lot about the... Uh, the governor's proclamation. I guess, first of all, uh, we put a lot of stock in the governor, and I think that's very important that we not ignore the governor's uh, decree or his uh, uh, executive orders. But our first concern through all of this COVID crisis has been to make you all feel comfortable being in the Lord's house. So as we look at the changes that the governor is, is recommending, which is, uh, for fully vaccinated people being able to remove masks, uh, for churches that, uh, that have attendance under 100 to be able to remove the blue tape and be able to gather without being as concerned about the social distancing. Uh, we need, and that will really be the, the gist of the meeting that the board will be taking uh, following worship in determining our direction moving ahead. Are we comfortable? Do we feel that our folks here at Mount Carmel are going to be comfortable with taking the blue tape and being able to fill the sanctuary if we have that size crowd to take down masks, at least for fully vaccinated people? Uh, 
that's going to be the discussion that the board has today and determine uh, where we go from here. Because we are seeing things improve and opening up, and we're thankful that we're having more folks attending in person. We continue to offer the Facebook Live uh, recordings, and we welcome those people to continue with the Facebook Live if they choose. We'll continue that, uh, but we're hoping that we can eventually come back to whatever normal means for our worship. So again, board members, as a, a uh, picture of what we're going to talk about, uh, that's the intent of the board meeting. And if you have an interest in participating in that conversation but aren't a member of the board, you're certainly welcome to stay uh, following the worship and offer your uh, thoughts and, and input. Uh, we, we need to know what is going to make you comfortable being in the Lord's house on Sunday morning because we'd like to have everybody here where we can be together with the worship and fellowship together. Uh, and we can only do that if people are comfortable being here. So again, that is what the board will be discussing following the worship this morning. With that said, are there other announcements that anyone would like to share at this time? Um, if we do have any visitors, could we uh, have a green card passed out to them so that we can get some record of their visit? That would be great. Absolutely. Yeah, we will uh, bring a visitor card around here in a little bit. And for those visitors, we'd like for you to fill out the, the card so that we have a record of your visit. We're so thankful that you're here with us. Any other uh, announcements? Let's take a moment or two and say good morning to those around us as our song leader comes to lead us in our chorus. <laughs>
come forward or, or somebody would just simply volunteer to usher. It seems like our head usher is gone. He doesn't have his recruiting finger out there right now. We just give you praise and thanks that we have the opportunity to return a small portion of that which you blessed us today. Bless this offering and bless each one who's able to give. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
you so much. Appreciate that. Okay. Um, it is so good to be with you today, and I trust that God's been good to you this week. Um, of course, God's been kind of good to me this week, brought my daughter back from college, and now my house is full of music. Because <laughs> she doesn't just do that on Sunday, she does that every day of the week at the house. And uh, it just is beautiful, and it's so nice to have, have her home. Um, I made the mistake last week of not turning on my travel mic, so I better make sure I get it done this time so that, uh, so that I don't get the wave from back in the sound booth. But uh, anyways, uh, I, uh, I pray God's blessings on you this week. A uh, couple of things, uh, Dick Laura is in the hospital, so uh, keep him in your prayers, please. So, Last I knew, they didn't exactly know what was causing it, but he's got a persistent fever. And uh, so they're trying to figure that out. They took some blood or doing some blood work on him. But uh, he said that his sister is in a uh, rehabilitation center and wanted me to make sure and mention that. And um, then, uh, let's see here. Oh, uh, oh, a friend of a friend of Bradley's, uh, Bradley Doves, uh, was in an accident at work, and uh, it, his foot got crushed, and he lost a toe. So uh, Cindy and Bradley were wanting us to be sure and uh, bring them, bring that person to your attention for your prayers. Okay. Uh, any other prayer requests or maybe updates to the prayer list, Jenny? Suffers and all 
all going through, and um, just he he could he did a ton of love details, but it was serious. So just pray for their family. Okay. All right. Friend of Courtney's. Anything else? Yes, Dad. My <coughs> excuse me. My cousin's husband, Kevin, has been on the prayer list. He's been on a, a, a ventilator for several weeks, suffering from COVID, and he had an infection that they were having a hard time tracking down. But um, she said this week that he has been improving. She's finally been allowed to actually go in and see him, and he was able to respond slightly to her voice. So that's a praise, and I appreciate okay. the prayers for Kevin Thomas. Okay, continue to pray for Kevin. Anything else? Um, yes, in the back. same one or Pretty I saw your hands up. Pretty much? I just want to make sure you saw her. Oh, okay. You don't need to see me. <laughs> what was the name of that? Chad. What was his last name? Mines. M-I-N-E-S. Mines. M-I-N-E-S. Okay. Anything else? I was just going to do a praise. Um, I saw where the pastor Carol and Carol made it to their destination. They had asked for prayer, and I'm thankful for that, and that they have a new great-grandchild. So <coughs> yeah. Was, I'm just saying. But they made it okay, because Carol wasn't feeling well. Well, that's really great they were able to be there for the birth of their great-grandchild. So, um, anything else before we go to prayer? Okay, let's look to the Lord. In love, God, did you create us. In mercy, you have redeemed us. By the great price of your Son, we now are able to come before you without priest, without ritual, without blood. For the blood of Christ is sufficient, and his priesthood is sufficient, and his mercy is sufficient. We need no more than what he has done for us. And we praise you in Jesus' name that we can bring these petitions before you. In our grief, we languish for the health of our friends and our loved ones, and we weep with those who have lost ones dear to their hearts. And God, I pray that even now you would pour out your spirit upon us for our comfort, but also for our strength. For there are those, Lord, that are going to need a kind word, are going to need a phone call or a card or a visit. And Lord, it would not be right for us to wait on everyone else to do something for all the Lord those that are grieving and are concerned over the health of their friends and loved ones I pray Father that you would give them the pause and the time to jot something down on a card to encourage that one or that family that has lost a loved one and is grieving give them the words to say because there's nothing we can say to bring back or to undo what has been done. But there are all kinds of things that can be said. And sometimes just 
to step up and just to be with them is sufficient. But we are a congregation of ministers that have been called by you as a royal priesthood and a holy people to represent God in these situations. And there are those situations that we are close to and there would be no better than us to step up. And I pray God you would help us to do just that. Many are uncomfortable being put in sensitive situations. <clears throat> But you said, Lord, that the Holy Spirit is willing to give us words, is willing to help us in our time of need and intercede for us between us and God with groans that words cannot express. And so, Lord, we groan inwardly, wanting to see you magnified, you glorified in the midst of all of this pain and hurt. We pray, Lord, for pregnancies that are building expectation in the hearts of the mothers and fathers, that they would go well, that the babies would be born in health. And for babies, Lord, that are not completely healthy and are struggling, with their development. We pray for their moms and their dads as they are grieving and worried as to what may happen or might come. But in the midst of all of this, help us to remember, God, that you are sovereign and that matters can be discussed with you so that we can get things straightened out in our hearts. It is not so much, Lord, that you need to see what faith we have, but that we need to see the faith that you have built into us so that we can see that we have come much further than we realize. And because of this, Lord, we can praise you for your sovereignty and not worry that these events of life take, us, take you by surprise the way they take us by surprise. Be with those, Lord, that are in the armed forces, and I pray, God, you would help them to achieve all that you would have them to achieve. Be with those that are in the emergency services. And we think, Lord, about our police force and, and the losses that uh, they have endured. And we ask God your continued support for them. And we ask God also for your help for our EMTs and our medical teams that are in the hospitals. For there are many lives that hang in the balance of their daily duties and I know that it is a great pressure for some of them. And I pray, Father, that your hand would guide our missionaries. For the gospel must go forward, even in the danger of loss of life. The gospel must be preached. God, you must be glorified. Help them, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're turning our attention now to the scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 through 24. Corinthians chapter 1, starting to read at verse 18. For the message of the cross 
is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since the wisdom of God, the world through his wisdom did not know him. God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs and Gentiles look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of, oh, that's where I was going to quit, I think. Okay? Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. The scripture makes this statement. We preach Christ crucified. That is the most foolish message in the whole world. Here's why. We say the champion of our faith, the one who will be king over all of the earth, came to this earth and was overcome, it seems, by men and died. That seems as foolishness. Now, some of us who have been saved, we have gone through the process of weighing out that gospel message, and at a time, it did seem like foolishness to us. Those of us who were brought up in a religious home or a religious atmosphere, we always just kind of accepted it, that that was just what happened. We always celebrate the resurrection, and everybody says, well, you don't talk about the crucifixion without talking about the resurrection. Now, the reason that we say that is because we're concerned that if we talk about the crucifixion and don't mess, mention the resurrection, that we've talked about the bad part, but not the good part. When in truth, we've talked about the best part. The best part is what God did on that cross. But as we see, that is foolishness to some and a stumbling block to others. And I want us to take a really solid look at this statement. We preach Christ crucified. We're going to start out by talking about the fact that we preach. This preaching is foolishness to men. It is foolishness. I, I, I talked to a fellow that was a, he, he would say that he was a Christian. And uh, he said, that the idea of God crushing his own son on the cross for yours and my sin is like God saying to somebody, you sinned and therefore I'm going to kill myself. And to him, this made no sense. It was foolishness to him, a stumbling block to him. But the gospel is not, you sinned and therefore I'm going to kill myself. That is not the gospel. As we have gone through this series on Christ in the last few months, we have unfolded multiple parts of who Christ is. That he's the manifestation of God himself as the second person of the Trinity. That he is uh, the, the son that he is the begotten one, that he is the bridegroom. We've unfolded that he's the gate, that he's the shepherd, that he is the bread, that he's the head of the body, that he is the vine to our branches, that he's the very connection that we have to God, and that the whole reason that he had to die was so that you and I could inherit that death through marriage. Because you and I have to die for our sins. We have to. 
But if Christ becomes the head of the body, the body then enjoys everything that the head has to offer. If our head has died and raised from the dead and now sits at the right hand of God, it is only natural the body should follow. So we inherit the death of Jesus Christ. We inherit the holiness of Jesus Christ. We inherit the righteousness of Jesus Christ because of the union of marriage. And as we said in the message to the kids, we talked about the Cinderella story. I'll simplify it. Cinderella one day has nothing, lives in the ashes. The next day she marries the prince, has everything. For what reason? For what cause? Because the prince loved her, and she loved the prince, and because the prince was willing to marry her, she went from an absolute pauper to an absolute princess in one day. Now that's a simplification of the story. It's a simplification of your story, and yet it's true. This is exactly what happens to the one whom God has mercy. If God has mercy upon you, it is the foolishness that we preach that because he weds us right now in a betrothal, later in time, in human time, there will be a wedding feast. But right now we are betrothed, and we know that a betrothal can only be broken through divorce, according to what we read in Matthew chapter 1. So therefore, this Christ that we preach is foolishness. Why? Why is he foolishness to men? Because men are looking for a way to save themselves. They are not looking for a salvation that completely takes them out of the equation and puts all of it in the hands of God. They are looking for a salvation that will be morals, principles, stories and instructions that will help them to be better people, better parents, better neighbors, better friends, better humanitarians. That's what they are looking for. And the idea of a gospel that takes all of that out of their hands and depends completely upon the sovereignty and the will of God is foolishness to them. In uh, 1 Corinthians, again, chapter 1, now verse 27, we see stated there, but God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. What does he mean there? Marriage means that in the marriage, the woman is the weaker of the two because she must submit, as we talked last week, she must submit to her husband. And that puts her in the weaker position in the relationship. It's not to say that she's weaker in will or weaker in some other sociological or psychological aspect. It is that God has deliberately put her in the weaker spot. He created Adam in his own image and created Eve in the image of Adam. And this is the gospel, it's the truth, it's the story of the scripture. I'm not sitting here making, again, not making sociological or psychological or or any kind of other scientific or anthropological statement here. I'm just simply saying that is the way that it is. Whether you like it or whether you don't like it really is irrelevant if it is the way that it is. And I am not simply trying to construct something for you and then cram you into that construct. But if what I am stating to you is the truth, then you have to start from the truth and then figure out how you're going to deal with it and react to it. When it says here that he chose the weak things to confound the strong, it is that he put the church in the weaker position. The church is the weaker. 
in the two. Christ is strong. Christ has all the power, all the authority. He has the power of eternal life, the power of life and death, the power of right and wrong in His hands. He has the power to either raise you up or to drop you low. When you come to Christ as a Christian and you give yourself completely to Him, He has the right to crush you if He will get glory out of crushing you, and He has the right to raise you high if He will, if he will get glory by raising you high. And you must submit to that no matter what. And so He chooses the weaker things to confound the strong because it is confounding to the world that our early brothers and sisters marched to crosses to be nailed to them upside down to be doused in kerosene and lit on fire for the streets of Rome, that they would sing hymns of praise as they marched towards those crosses. That looks like weakness. To the Greeks, it looks like a stumbling block to the Jews. Why would God allow martyrs? Why would God allow people to be killed for their faith? The answer is found in the fact that men value this life more than anything. And those who know the Lord value eternal life more than anything. And so those Christians marched knowing that their pain would be momentary, would last maybe a day at the most, and that when their bodies gave way, their spirits would be free to be with the Lord. And so convinced were they that they marched to the lions singing hymns. They marched to their deaths praising the Lord. And this is foolishness to them. Chapter 2 of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, not very far off, verses 14, uh, 4 and 13, we read in verse 4, my message and my my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. And verse 13, we read there, this is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual realities with spiritually taught words. Again, our preaching, it is not with regards to this life and how to make it better. It is regards ultimately to the life to come and how to escape this current wrath that we are under. Now, often people have said, I don't like to go to church. There is all of this hell and brimstone preaching. I'm not talking hell and brimstone. I'm talking about fact and fiction. I'm talking about truth and lies. And if you want to base your life on a fiction and on a lie, you're welcome to do so. I'm sure that there are churches out there willing to tell you whatever you want to hear. But it is the responsibility of a man of God, a servant of God, to stand in this pulpit at a point at which he could either be crushed by God from the one end or by his congregation from the other end and still preach the truth, leaving all in the hands of God. I take this very seriously. I do not come to you with words of my own personal wisdom. I cross-reference everything in Scripture. I do that on your behalf so that you will know that what I am preaching 
is God's word and that it is in agreement throughout the scripture so that you can have confidence that you are not hearing Pastor Scott's personal doctrines and personal ideas about how to be a good person, but you are instead hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 5, we read this, because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power and with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. There is power in the gospel. Now that power and that demonstration of power in the Old Testament, he is referring at times to miraculous signs. But in this day and age, we have sinned so greatly against God, having the knowledge of God, we have pushed him away. We have insisted upon a religion that would compromise between humanism and the gospel to such a degree that God rarely anymore will demonstrate anything with signs and wonders. At this point, God could turn the sky from blue to red, and most people would shrug their shoulders and continue to live as they have always lived. The difference today, the great miracle today, is that you should hear the truth and actually listen to it. And so God still brings the gospel with power, but that power is in the truth. There also is the condemnation of the world's wisdom that we see. In John chapter 7, verse 7, Jesus says to his own brothers, The world cannot hate you, but it hates me, because I testify that its works are evil. To his own brothers, born in Mary and Joseph's household, he makes this statement. Now you would think that if there was anybody on this earth second to Jesus that would be holy or would be righteous or would be somehow spotless enough, it would be his own natural brothers. But he says to them, this evil world loves you, but it hates me because I testify its works are evil. There is a reason that we preach, and one of the reasons that we preach is not just to di distinguish between the foolishness of men and the power of God, but it is also to condemn the world's wisdom and rebuke its values. Now, many of us look around at the world we live in in America and we say, well, you know, we have pretty good values. Our people are pretty wise. Well, you're lucky because you live in a world that you live in a nation that still is under the influence of the Christian consensus that the Bible is true, that God is sovereign, and that there are morals that are in keeping with that sovereignty. Other nations do not have such restraints upon them. And there, the people are more to be feared than the wild animals. So when you look about yourself and you say, well, we have pretty good values. You have values that have so decayed over the last 200 years that they were so powerful when they started and they have so decayed now over 200 years that they are still better than living in darkest Africa and living through some of the savagery that goes on in the Middle East. Think about that. 200 years of human decay of values and still the values of God, even in their decayed and diminished form, sustain our society and keep us from absolutely 
tormenting each other. It is not the strong arm of the law that keeps that from happening. We are seeing that shown to us daily on the news. That those who do not wish to acknowledge our legal and law enforcement officers can create such havoc that from the top and from the bottom those that are still trying to hold those values are squashed. We condemn this world's wisdom. We condemn this world's values. This world values sex above marriage. This world values personal peace above neighborly love. This world values self above God. And we stand opposed to those values. We stand opposed to their goals, to their hopes and their dreams. Now we do not rail them in the face. We do not give them a hard time. We are not rude about it. But we are firm. We're a stumbling block for the religious. Psalm 118.22, Isaiah 28.16, Zechariah 10.14. All of these are prophecies about the cornerstone over which the religious stumble. They stumble over Christ. They stumble over the person of Christ. They do not stumble over his teachings. They stumble over his person, who he was, that he was man and yet was God. In Romans chapter 9, verses 30 to 32, we read this. What shall we say? That the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have obtained it, a righteousness that is by faith. But the people of Israel who pursued the law as the way of righteousness have not attained their goal. Why not? Because they pursued it not by faith, but as if it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. This is the problem with religion. Religion says that by the teachings you have eternal life. John 5, 39, Jesus is saying exactly this to the Pharisees. Religion believes that if it just teaches people the right way to live and the right way to behave, that somehow that teaching is going to change radically the condition of men so that men will no longer be sinners but saints. And this is not the truth. The Bible says that salvation is the power of God. And it can only happen because God transforms you. We preach Christ. We, I'm going to go through this a little bit quicker. We reject this life in exchange for Christ. In Mark 8, 34 to 38, we read this, Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose their own soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes into his Father's glory and with his holy angels. Unfortunately, the gospel that is being preached today 
is that we're going to enjoy this life and later we'll enjoy eternal life. To have it all. To have both things. But the Bible says if you want to save your life for the future, you need to lose your present life. You need to turn aside from the goals and the dreams and the hopes that you have for this world and instead invest your goals, hopes, and your dreams in heaven for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I'm not saying that God tells us to have a miserable time here. What I'm telling you is that God says don't live for the happy times that you have here. Like, take the happy times, enjoy the happy times. Because coming around the bend, someone is going to get killed in a traffic accident or murdered or harmed in some way. Somebody in your life is going to cause you tremendous grief. So enjoy the happy moments. But do not invest in this life as if somehow you are going to wrangle it like a calf, drive it to the ground, and tie it like a rodeo cowboy and force happiness out of it. This life is only going to give you moments of happiness. It is not ultimately going to give you happiness. We exchange the glory of man for the glory of Christ. Romans 1, 21, 23, we see the opposite. That because they were not grateful and did not glorify God, they exchanged the glory of Christ for the glory of man. We do the opposite. We exchange the glory of man for the glory of Christ. Christ himself is not recorded in any history book. Except for the Bible. According, I mean, as far as original historical works. There is no history book at the time of Christ that records him at all. Other than a little mention of a carpenter of Nazareth that Josephus, the historian, makes... He never even names him as Jesus. Most of the revivals that have happened in this world have not been recorded in history. Most of those who have done amazing things for God have not been recorded in history. There's a book called The Light and the Glory by um, uh, Marshall, it was Peter Marshall Jr., uh, that contains stories in it of how God worked in early America through revivals and through Christians to protect America and to uh, bring America to birth. It's a book worth reading. The Light and the Glory is what it's called. We exchange the glory of men. We don't want to be in their history books. We don't care. Their history books are going to burn anyway. We don't want to be remembered well. We don't care if, you know, like, like Ebenezer Scrooge cared so much that his grave was overrun and nobody came to visit or came to pay respects to it. Uh, for his reasons, it was good for him to care. For our reasons, it is not good for us to care. Okay, because as time goes on, somebody may search out our grave site as an ancestry uh, hunt that they are on, but for the most part, our children are not going to be every day at our grave grieving, and we would not want them to do that. And then next, and I apologize that I'm not belaboring these probably as much as you might like, but I am trying to be sensitive to your schedules. We condemn our own flesh, longing for the Spirit of Christ. In Romans 7 and 7, 18, and in Romans 8, 3, we see these references. 7, 18, I know that there, nothing good dwells within me, that is, within my flesh. I disagree with the translation of the NIV that says my sinful nature. The King James is better there. It's more accurate. It is the flesh that it's talking about, not just the sinful nature. Uh, because the sinful nature is eradicated when the Holy Spirit fills you and you are born again of the Spirit. You get the Spirit of Christ in you, and the Spirit of Christ is certainly not going to dwell in the same room with your sinful nature. 
he will drive it out. And in chapter 8, verse 3 of Romans, we read this, For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering and to condemn sin in the flesh. We condemn our own flesh, and we long for the Spirit of Christ. What does this mean? That we don't have it? No, I mean we long for it as in every day we long to commune with the Spirit of Christ. Too many Christians today are communing with their flesh and calling that spiritual. Too many Christians today are attracting to them people who encourage them to follow their hearts. Do not follow your heart, I am warning you. It is corrupt, wicked, and deceitful above all things, and the scripture says, who can know it? It is the worst advice you've ever gotten. Follow your heart, follow your intuition. Worst advice in the whole wide world. At least for a Christian. We preach Christ crucified. We preach this impossible ransom. Take a look at Psalms 49. And we're looking at uh, verses 7 through 9. Listen to what it says. No one can redeem the life of another or give to God a ransom for them. The ransom for a life is costly. No payment is ever enough so that they would live on forever and not see decay. Do you hear the command of God? No one, listen again, no one can redeem the life of another. So how did Jesus do it? Or give to God a ransom for them. How did Jesus give his life as a ransom then? So that they could live on forever and never see decay. That's exactly the promise that we're saved by. That we would live on forever and not see decay. How is it that God has done the impossible? Because it was God, the second person of the Trinity who was in Christ, the son of Mary. He said no man can give a ransom. God is the only one that could ransom your soul. We preach Christ crucified because that crucifixion is the impossibility of Psalm 49, verses 7 through 9. God did the impossible in saving you. And then last of all, the impossible justification. In Exodus 34, verses 6 and 7, God recites his own attributes. And he says this, and, and he passed in front of Moses proclaiming, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet, he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children of the children for their sin of their fathers to the third and fourth generation. How impossible to be a God who forgives sin, wickedness, and rebellion, and yet does not leave the guilty unpunished. How impossible to be that God. But he is that God, perfect in love, perfect in justice, all at the same time. Romans chapter 3, verses 25 and 26. And we read this. God presented 
Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be both just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. And once again, we see that he's taken man out of the equation. By taking man out of the equation, God is able to do something that is holy, that no man is capable of doing or could have done. And he justifies us with an impossible justice. We're going to close with Galatians chapter 3, verses 10 to 14. I invite you to turn there. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. As it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Clearly, no one who relies on the law is justified before God because the righteous will live by faith. The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, it says, the person who does these things will live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a pole. He redeemed us in or tree, actually, is the better word there. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. Do you see what we are seeing in the Scripture? It could only be by the power of God that you could be saved because it's impossible otherwise. We preach Christ crucified. We do not preach Christ's teaching. We preach his crucifixion because what happened at that crucifixion, the depths and the breadth of that, you will be studying forever and still never fully expire the glory of God in doing the impossible to save you. The value of your salvation is so much greater than you are giving it. The value of your salvation to the community around you is so much greater than you're giving it credit for. The value of what God has done in your life, the value of Christ Jesus himself, he is indispensable because through him, those who were born into this world as he was born into this world, according to the scripture in Galatians 4, born to a woman, born under law, to redeem those under the law. Folks, you need a higher view of God. You need a higher view of Christ. You need a higher view of salvation. Because unfortunately, too much of the preaching that has been going around has completely drained the power and the authority out of it all. I'm sorry for the time. We'll skip the ending hymn and just have our prayer. I do want to remind you that uh, we do need to have our board meet for just a few minutes at the front. Members of the book club, well, you'll be meeting downstairs for your lunch, so uh, keep that in mind. Let us pray. Father God, we come before you thanking you and praising you for the precious blood of Jesus. As he did the impossible, taking our sins to the cross. that we might be saved, that we might spend eternity with you. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for that sacrifice. Thank you for the great love that you show for us who surrender to you. May we examine ourselves. May we examine our lives. Put away the lust and the desires of the flesh that lead us astray. And cling to Jesus and the wonderful gift that you've given us. Thank you, Lord, for your sacrifice. 
Thank you for the cleansing that only that sacrifice can bring. Bless us as we go out and carry this message with us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.